Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Layer Zero. I am permanent contributor at MakerDAO, at the Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling Core Unit. Today, I am going to talk to you about legal, legal topics, legal governance at DAOs. So a short agenda of my presentation. I will start off with an introduction of myself and the core unit that I represent. I will give you a brief overview on the evolution of MakerDAO in the last one and a half year. Then I'm going to talk about legal risks. DAOs and legal risks are very important topic currently. And I will end my presentation talking about the concept of decentralized legal operations. So first of all, disclaimer, nothing in this presentation is legal advice. So, so about myself, I have a legal background and I am Colombian. I was uh, born in Bogota, raised in the city. I am super proud uh, that this event happens in my native city and very proud of being part of this event. I am permanent contributor at MakerDAO since June, 2021. I work at a core unit that is called the Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling Core Unit. The mission of this core unit is... Oh. The mission of this core unit is to sustainably grow makers' protocols modes by removing barriers between the centralized workforce, capital, and work. So the SES core unit is one of the 20 core units that MakerDAO has. And a, a brief overview, you probably all know that the Maker Foundation, which was a legal entity that bootstrapped the project and run the project during the first few years, it closed its doors. It dissolved last year and started giving its operations to an emerging DAO. February 2021, there were no core units. And in March 2021, were the first core units launched one in governance and two in business operations, one in real-world finance, and the other one in risk. And I, I like to call this process like a slow-mo big bang. Slowly, month by month, new core units were being added to the ecosystem. Our core unit, the SES core unit, was ratified in April 2021. So you can see if you go forward month by month, new core units were being added. And these core units that have a little hat, site stream, development and UX, tech ops and Unify security were incubated by our core units. Our core unit also has an incubation program. Then 2022, the market conditions started to change. Bear market and the first core, some core units were off-boarded. And that shows one important characteristic of DAOs, that DAOs are flexible. DAOs grow when the market is good. DAOs shrink when the market is bad. And some core units were reported, and uh, currently there are three core units that uh, there is a proposal, off-boarding proposal for reporting three uh, further core units. So that is the situation right now. 20 operative core units, and there is a proposal for reporting three of them. What is the future of MakerDAO? Probably you have heard about the end game plan. The end game plan is a restructuring process, a restructuring proposal for MakerDAO. It's a very complex, a very fascinating proposal. But in its core, it consists of having a maker core, a very decentralized, permissionless, automatized maker core that should run DAI. DAI, as you know, is the world leading, leading decentralized stablecoin. Maker Core should be as stable, as decentralized, and autonomous as Bitcoin. Should have a, like a Bitcoin great type of decentralization and autonomy. And then everything else will be executed in MetaDAOs. MetaDAOs are like sub-DAOs that would be related to Maker Core, sort of like a subsidiary of a mother company. And things like operations, te technical, technological development, legal, business development, real world business, you name it, will be executed in the periphery. The idea is that 
risk and complexity is outsourced and is executed outside Maker Core because the main purpose of Maker is to run a stable, stable coin, a, re a neutral and decentralized stable coin. And the only way to do that is to do it like a, you know, in a Bitcoin grade type of decentralization. It is a very uh, complex uh, proposal, and it is here is a chart of the tokenomics. Uh, we call it the the crown. <laughs> it has like a shape of a crown, and uh, this is all the possible implementations that could be added to the ecosystem in the next 20, 10 to 20 years. So that is only an example to give you an idea how complex and ambitious is the uh, restructuring process of MakerDAO and uh, its stablecoin DAI. So let's talk about legal. And probably all of you know, have heard about yeah, regulatory fraud, regulatory bad news in the last month. I have extracted two of the most yeah, uh, worst regulatory developments that we have seen. The, the first one was the recent uh, lawsuit of CFTC, the American Commodities Regulator, which for first time in the history sues a DAO. Not a legal entity, not a person, it sues a DAO. And even worse, it serves the DAO members putting a forum post in the forum of Okidao, and then it considered in that way that all DAO members are served, are notified from the, law, from the lawsuit. That has raised a lot of concerns in the industry because it could imply personal liability of token holders that vote, that are active in governance. So this is only a first stage. This is not a law, this is not a precedent. It's a lawsuit, but a judge has to decide on this lawsuit. We hope that a judge will recognize that it is illegal for many reasons, the, the, the actuations of the CFTC, but it is a concerning development. The second one that all of you know probably was the uh, tornado cash incident. For first time in the history, a regulator sanctioned a smart contract, an open source protocol, not a legal entity, not a person, but an open source protocol. Probably they don't know the implications of doing that. Not only because I think it's illegal, but because they don't have the faculties to do that, but because of the second and third order consequences of um, sanctioning a protocol. Of course, that is related with the arrest of a developer of Tornado Cash in Amsterdam, which was over a month ago. We still don't know the charges. So that is a concerning development. So sadly, regulatory risks, legal risks, have increased. But how should DAOs deal with legal issues? You have in a centralized organization, you have a person that is called a legal counsel. This person manage all legal topics. But we, have, we are now in the DAO world. Who and how should we take care of legal risks? You all know that centralized organizations and DAO have significant differences in its structure. Centralized organizations have a top-down pyramidal hierarchy. The structure is normally very rigid. And legal roles, for example, the legal counsel or the chief legal officer, sit on the top of the structure. They normally have authority over the hierarchies that are below them and have the uh, authority of deciding all legal strategy and managing legal risks. The legal representation in a centralized organization is obviously centralized. And contributors, especially the, the ones that are in the lower layers of the hierarchy, are subordinated and dependent from the top. Now, what do we have in DAOs? In DAOs, we don't have a top-down hierarchy. DAOs have structure but its structure is flexible and organic. In a DAO, no single party should represent the whole organization. It would be a central point of failure. And contributors are autonomous and self-managed. So definitely, this is, the, this is the moment of introducing our concept of decentralized legal operations. So decentralized operations 
what do we understand under decentralized operations? It, it is a similar concept than DAO governance, but it is a more powerful one. DAO governance yeah, refers more to how work is done, which processes are in place, how people take collectively a decision, who has authority over what, or competence over what. But it doesn't involve like, actually doing the work, executing the work. Decentralized decision making needs to be supported by execution. So this concept of decentralized operations includes governance, but also emphasizing the execution. Applying that to the legal world, decentralized legal operations are processes for sourcing and coordinating legal work in an open, transparent, and decentralized organization. These processes should be explicit and flexible, and very importantly, they should be product-centric. So we want to productize legal services. And why it's important? Yeah, you can argue a lot about which processes are the best ones or not. We simply develop product features that others can use. And importantly, all these products should be open source. So I'm going to give you some examples of some of the products that we will propose to Maker Governance to give you an idea. The first product is related to regulatory risk monitoring. The purpose of this product is to mitigate regulatory risk. So the process that we want to productize is first, we are identifying which are the relevant regula regulatory areas that impact Maker and its contributors and delegates. Then affect, identify the affected stakeholders and their specific jurisdictions. So we are going to map out all of the teams and say, depending on the area, of the world that they work and depending on the business that they are doing, which regulations could apply to them. This is not static. It will be dynamic, monitoring the development of regulations and also red flagging when there is an existential threat or existential risk. The product would be something like a Venn diagram where uh, we make a chart of the relevant laws or jurisdictions that affect all of the stakeholders in MakerDAO. That would be the first one, first product idea. The, first, the second product is internal risk monitoring. The purpose of this product is to increase resilience by progressive decentralization. Decentralization is the main tool for reducing regulatory risk. Many regulators had recognized that decentralized organizations could be excluded from the regulatory frameworks. But of course, decentralization is not a binary black and white thing. It is a spectrum. So we want to, the process that we want to productize is document all operations, value flows and processes of MakerDAO, identify the choke, the choke points, the centralization points of failure, and measure for each of these ones degree of, this, of centralization. So the product will be a decentralization matrix where we measure different areas, such as governance or technical development or marketing or all of the areas that are relevant to the organization and uh, classify them in a matrix and then propose corrective measures. Third product, legal best practices. The purpose of this product is to reduce legal risk. And what happens? We are working at the forefront. We are, as an industry, all facing similar risks and challenges and unknown problems. Each one is handling these problems in a different way, but if we do it systematically, we can learn from each others. So the process that we want to productize here is first, document all the problems faced by core units or any actor in the ecosystem, then document how they are approaching these problems. All these solutions are very specific to the country where the contributor is residing and the business that the activity that is performing. And then the idea is to create an open source and public knowledge base with, pro with problems and solutions. The product will be like a stock overflow where you can ask your questions and you can have an overview on how others, probably in an anonymized way, have deal with these problems. And this will be also, of course, dynamic. Fourth, provide legal advice. Of course, very relevant. We don't have legal counsel, so who? provide necessary legal advice. 
So our idea is the purpose is to provide the necessary legal support to DAO participants. How do we want to do that? We are going to document systematically all legal questions and issues that people have. Parallelly classify all the legal advisors that have worked with us or that have worked with any person of the ecosystem. Classify them by jurisdiction, area of law, experience, build up our reputation system and match legal problems with legal advisors that could assess these issues. We believe that legal advice should not be internal to the DAO, should be external. DAO should externalize, outsource legal advice. There's many reasons to do that. One is that like, the legal world is the most fragmentalized, compartmentalized discipline of us. Yeah, we have 190 jurisdictions, we have dozens of areas of law, so it would be impossible to have in-house all the knowledge that people need. So what we need is a network of, decentralized network of legal advisors, classified by area of law and country, which would help people out. And the second reason is also because of legal risk. Legal advice, providing legal advice is a way of transferring risk. You transfer risk to the legal advisor. And we want to have this outside the DAO. So the product would be a decentralized lawyer registry that uh, would help people match their problems with some advisor specialists that will help them out. The fifth and last product idea that I will present is about transferring legal risk insurance. And probably also, you know, it many of the risks are non-insurable. It's very hard to get liability insurance in the crypto world. Why? Because no insurance company will insure our risks because they are too uncertain or too big to be insured. So what we are working on is, in a, we call it in the traditional world, a DNO, directors and officers insurance. It's like a liability insurance. And the process that we want to productize is first, we are in the process of identifying and classifying all the risks that we are subject to. A risk taxonomy. Identify who is affected by these risks. Quantify them and transfer these risks to a fund, could be a self-owned fund, a legal defense fund, or a self-insurance fund. And we are now parallelly um, exploring integrations with this, this uh, Unluckily, it is very hard to see that it is a, a POC with a Kleros. Kleros is a decentralized dispute resolution protocol, Bitcoin Ethereum, and we could build with them a liability insurance which would be executed permissionlessly, who could anonymously, who could be like anybody, any person could submit a claim, could challenge a claim, who could decide on a claim, and that's all based on a token-based game theoretic framework, which is very interesting. It would be, for us, it's very important, all of these products to develop them, de de develop them in a permissionless and decentralized way. So that's an overview of the products. Um, thank you for your attention, and I am happy to answer your questions. Any questions? I, yeah, I can I can share my slides. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that reach out, and um, yeah, we all have we are all facing the common the same problems, and if we help each other, then we can go further. And thank you for your attention. Oh, a little question about the last slide for insurances. Can you elaborate a bit more about um, the um, undertaker, the um, legal framework for, insurance in, for insuring, which is also very regulated? Yes, absolutely. So if we have a, a self-insured fund that is very typical in the risk management industry, a self-insurance fund that is owned by the organization that uh, you don't have to comply with external regulations. If you have an insurance company that you accept risks from third parties, yes. But in the insurance world, when you have risks that are very hard to mitigate or to transfer, one typical way is to have a, a, a fund, a contingency fund, self-owned by, by the company or the organization or now the DAO, and could pay out risks that you cannot insure elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And you can use this as a first layer. You can use it as a font for paying legal cost of defense in somebody's suit. But you could use this as, as, a, as a first layer, as a deductible for covering other risk. With a self-insurance fund in place, you can go to the insurance industry and place other risk that, that otherwise could, could not be possible. But we want to um, implement it with a permissionless dashboard. Uh, that is our objective, and that is on the roadmap. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I understood that you are trying to like uh, transfer risks, but uh, you have like a uh, uh, le yeah, I mean, less risks to these new compliance things that are happening in the world. But I, I'm wondering if you also have a solution to minimize the risk for the voters. Yeah, that that is a very broad question. Yeah, because what what risk, right? So there are different layers of risks. One first layer is somebody sued. Who pay, the, who pay the legal cost of defense. So that is the first layer of the risk that we want to, that we want to uh, cover. Then it depends, there are certain risks that are, are non-insurable. For example, criminal liabilities. That is the danger, our concern with the OFAC topics. These AML topics often imply criminal responsibilities like jail time, and you cannot, you cannot insure that. So we can develop Frameworks for retaining risk or transferring risk are transferable, but we cannot insure everything because, yeah, something like you cannot insure against jail time, huh? but you can insure uh, uh, against a lot of things. But the first layer is have an insurance fund that pays your legal costs. That is the first layer. And then you can go step by step and, and cover all the risks. Okay, then thank you guys.